Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Holy Comforter Episcopal Church. I'm Jimmy Abbott, the priest at Holy Comforter, and this is our Fall 2020 Adult Christian Formation series called Liturgy, the Work of the People. We had a great time doing this from September to November, and we had a wrap-up discussion. And in that wrap-up discussion, there were some more topics that came up that, that weren't originally discussed. So I'm taking this time during Advent to step back and to, to do a, a few more episodes. It's our, our postscript, if you will. Just a reminder, the guiding question to this series is, why do Episcopalians do what we do when we gather on Sundays and other special days of the year in the presence of God? Now, one of the things that we do is keep silence. It's interesting. We've talked about music. We've talked about language. We've talked about lots of noisy things. We've talked about lots of speech, but we haven't yet talked about silence. So let's do that. Now, I think it's providential. I've been reading a book on systematic theology published by my systematic theology professor from seminary. And right off the bat, in her book on the Holy Trinity, she has a long section on silence. And I'm going to read it to you. It's long, but it'll be here on your screen. So if you want to pause it and read it, you can do that too. Or uh, I'm going to read it right here for all of us. The presence of the Holy One discloses sin and blessing. But even more, the searing fire of holiness teaches the silence in which every mouth is stopped. Holy wisdom bestows the fear of the Lord that stills any presumption, any rash speech. Silence, we might say, is the music of the temple. The free will offerings, the cereal and sin and well-being offerings, the whole pungent and blood-soaked work of sacrifice are made in silence. The inner courtyard is bathed in blood and in silence. The Lord's presence, his smoke-filled glory, consumes any voice but the heavenly beings who can but cry, Holy! The whole earth is reduced to silence when the Lord descends to his temple. It is the very first praise and reverence of creatures before their God. The wordless worship of the greater and lesser lights, the stars and their courses. The silence, rest, and blessing of Sabbath. The silence of the prophets before the one who calls. The silence Aaron must keep when fire burns away rebellion. The silence that envelops the boy Samuel in the haunted darkness of the temple. The sheer silence of the Lord as he passes by. The stillness in heaven after the Lamb, alone the worthy one, breaks open the seventh seal, and the mighty choruses and tumult are stopped. And at the end, when all have drawn their last breath, the primal silence that breaks out for seven days, the holy consummation and peace, the final Sabbath, the serene glory that stood at the beginning of all things. The whole earth, the whole human race, the whole creaturely realm, not just the chosen people, keep this silence. But to Israel is given this prophecy and gift, to them the temple, the sacrifice, the presence, the holy law, and they endure forever. And always the holy blessing is more. Israel is the light to the nations. It is representative, universal existence. The divine light overspreads, succeeds, presses down, and spills over so that the whole earth falls into the silence who is the holy God. Silence is the presence and the sign of presence of the holy triunity, the majesty of the one God. I don't know what y'all think about that. I think that is awesome. That is some of the best writing I have read in a long time. And what, what rich theology and what rich scriptural allusions there from Revelation, from Exodus, from, uh, from Samuel as well. Really, really powerful stuff. And, and I just, I love this idea that 
the, the true worship of God is silence because in God's searing presence, our lips must be stilled. Mm. So if y'all want to munch on that some more, you're more than welcome to. Now, moving to practical issues, let's talk some about silence, especially silence when it comes to the service of the Holy Eucharist. Now, all throughout the services, there are places in which the rubric says silence may follow or silence may be kept. It's especially right before the confession of sin and right after any of the scripture lessons. Some of the forms of the prayers of the people have also built in times of silence, but, but those uh, forms of prayer rotate frequently. There's really only one place in the entire service of the Holy Eucharist in which scripture or in which silence is required by the prayer book. And that's right at the fraction anthem. If you want to open it up, it's on page 364 of the Book of Common Prayer. The priest breaks the consecrated bread, and then the rubrics say a period period of silence is kept period of silence is kept. Now, I, I try to have a brief period of silence here, but even I, I, I'm aware of just what all is going on, that sometimes people are getting antsy, they want to move on. The choir is kind of getting ready for, uh, you know, their, their next song and all of that, the, the fraction anthem. But but I'm thinking about it, and, and perhaps I should dwell on the silence a little bit longer at the fraction anthem. This, this moment that reminds us of the crucified Christ, of the body of Jesus being broken open so that all sinners may be fed. That, that idea of from Revelation that the seventh seal has been broken and all heaven stands in silence. It is all consummated right here at the fraction anthem. So next time you're in church, I, I, you know, I'd love for you to think about that. That silence at this moment is the, the the fullness of our worship. That we have, we are about to receive the gifts of God given for us, and there is really nothing that we can say. Perhaps there's nothing that we should say because even what we would say in our sinfulness, would sully our gratitude. So a period of silence is kept. Now, practically speaking, do you get it? That's a pun, ha ha ha, speaking. I believe that there's a law of diminishing returns when it comes to silence and public worship. Of course, you know, we could stand there at the fraction for 10 minutes just reveling in what God is doing for us, reveling in that holy silence. And while you and I might enjoy doing that, I know that that's not going to work for a lot of folks. So while I think some periods of silence might catch us and make us pause, I, I think that the longer we stay in silence in public worship, the, the less effect it has as people with monkey brain, as Deacon Bob Lowry would say, start to get a little antsy and their brains start jumping around wondering, is Jimmy all right? Is he gonna move on? Why are we standing here? My stomach is growling. I hear that baby crying in the background. The ushers just walked in. I heard the door slam. There's all of that going on. So I do think it's important that, that silence right there is, is critical, but we can't do it forever. There is a practicality that the service does indeed have to, to, to go on. Which in a sense brings up a really good point about liturgy. That oftentimes we're going to default to the lowest common denominator. Now I'm not saying that people who cannot sit in silence are somehow lower or lesser, but in a large group public setting, all of those considerations have to be taken into place as we're designing worship. I also think that, you know, practically speaking, we're not Quakers. 
were not part of, as they would call themselves, the society of friends in which sitting in silence is, is the mainstay of their worship. We would say it is, uh, it is the, the culmination, the consummation of worship, but we also know that God has given us the power of speech, the word of God, and so uh, services need to also have noise and speech and music and sound. So it's a little bit of um, um, a, a compromise there. And again, I also think that if we build in too much silence into our regular public worship, we miss the gut punch of silence. I think, so think about it, it you know, our, our world now is so noisy, our church services are very noisy, more noise just kind of gets lost in the midst of it. In the same way, if all we did was silence, more silence would just get lost. So that's why I, I'm very, uh, try to be very clear, and, and, and I'm going to be doing better at this, especially as I, I've read and, and reflected for, for this session, of keeping that silence at the fraction so that it is the gut punch and the, the consummation of our worship. So journal question 15, why do you keep silence in your public prayers? Why do you keep silence in your private prayers? Remember, we're always going for the why question in this series. So I'd love for you to, to spend some time to journal why you think or why you keep silence in all of your prayers, both public and private. Again, it's been a lot of fun doing these postscript episodes. If you'd like me to, to address anything else, send it my way. I'd love to, to read and reflect and think about that and then share with you some of my thoughts. God bless you.